you stand up with us, Willow? Come on. Our Father's good. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. Draw me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Give mercy, you're my help in time. Oh, you help me, God. Lord, I can't Tell him he's faithful this morning. Faithful you are. Yes, you are. Faithful forever you will be. Yeah, faithful you are. And all your promises are yes to me. All your promises are yes Sing. He is kind, slow to anger. Come on, let's rest. I will rest in your promises, in your promises, my confidence. Come on, is your faithfulness, is your faithful. Try that with us. I will, I will rest, yeah, in your promises, my confidence. Oh, is your faithfulness, is your faithful. Oh, a little higher. I will.
guys up for singing a carol with us this morning. Oh, he brings us joy. Let's sing that. Again. Oh, joy to the world.
So sing this out with me. Sing. So light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Yeah. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Our response, come on. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow, here I am to say that you're my Christ, right. you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to
that's worthy of all honor and all praise and all glory, God. So we respond to you this morning. We respond to you with our songs and with our love, with our adoration, with our affection, with our offering. Be lifted high, Jesus. In your name, amen. You know, church, there's a beautiful picture in uh, Luke chapter 1 of, um, of Mary the mother of Jesus after she's been uh, met by the Holy Spirit and he's told her that she will um, have a son. She gets pregnant and she's visiting her uh, her aunt uh, Elizabeth and uh, there's a moment where she she feels the baby uh, leap in her womb and um, there's this really neat picture about worship and about praise but also all about Christmas, about uh, the coming of Jesus about Advent, and uh, the Bible says this, and I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, sometimes we wonder, why is it that we gather and sing? Why it feels a little bit like uh, it's just something we're supposed to do, and I'm not even sure why we do that. Uh, but it's because it's a natural response. Veronica just talked about that. It's a natural response to what he's done. And in the Bible, in Luke 1, it, it says that Mary sings a song of response and adoration and affection to our God. It's beautiful. And she says, my soul magnifies or glorifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. And it, she goes on to say, because he looks upon the humble and the lowly. And I love a couple of verses later. She says, for the mighty one has done great things for me. How many of you could say today, even in the middle of all the hustle and the bustle and the stress and the strain and family coming in and whatever. How many of you can say today that the mighty one has done great things for me? Great things for me. Yeah. So we're going to sing Mary's song this morning. My soul magnifies the Lord. Now, there's been some debate whether or not it would have gone exactly like this or not. I don't know. She was a Middle Eastern woman. I'm not sure she would have sung it this country, but we're going to give it a go, and, and it goes like this. My soul, my soul, magnifies the Lord. My soul, magnifies the Lord. He has done great things for me, great things for me. Come and worship, come and worship, do not be afraid. A company of angels, a company of angels, here's what they sang. Glory in the highest, and on earth peace among those on whom his favor rests. Come and worship him.
He magnifies the Lord my soul. Yeah. Magnifies the Lord. Here's why. And Lord, our souls sing that song this morning. You have done great things for us. Great and mighty are you, God, the mighty one. You've done great things for us, and we're so blessed and thankful this morning, Lord. You are the giver of life and of love. God, you came to save us and to set us free. And so this morning, let our song be a song that magnifies the Lord. And we bless you, we honor you this Advent season. Thank you, Jesus, that you came and you gave yourself to us. We pray all these things in your awesome and holy and magnificent name this morning. Amen. If you believe that, say amen. Let's thank our God again. Come on. He has done great things for us. Hey, Merry Christmas again. Would you just find somebody around you before you have a seat and say hello, introduce yourself, welcome them to our church. church. Merry Christmas. You know, I didn't uh, plan on saying this. We were, we were worshiping and down the front, just felt the Holy Spirit prompt me to share this because at Christmas time, this season of the year, it kind of is an emotional intensifier. And for those of us who are surrounded by family and are in a good season, this is a great time of year. But at the same time, there is uh, many of us in this room today where uh, this is a reminder. It's, it's, it's bringing something up in our lives. And maybe you're in a season that's got more challenge uh, than it has things just to be joyful about. And I want to share uh, kind of from a scripture that I've just been in personally. And again, I, I didn't plan to say this. I just felt the Holy Spirit say, hey, can I share this as a, as a word of encouragement. I've been in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, and many of you will be familiar with this story, but I've just kind of been parked in it over the last couple of weeks, reading it over and over again, and, and just kind of uh, getting involved in, in the details of it. But this is where Elijah and the prophets of Baal have a, a face-off, and Elijah challenges the prophets to build a fire, a, a, an altar, and to lay a sacrifice on it, but not to light the fire, but to spend time praying that uh, the God, that Baal would come and strike the fire and, 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 and ignite it, and that then Elijah would have his opportunity, and he would pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he would call down fire from heaven. And so there is this face-off, and at that time there were 450 prophets of Baal, and Elijah was the last prophet, the God of Israel. And so they gathered all 450 prophets, and they went first, and they built this wood altar and, and laid a calf on top of it. They didn't light it, 
But early in the morning, they started fervently to pray. And they prayed to Baal that he would come and strike this fire. And they prayed all through the morning and then into the afternoon. And then late into the afternoon, they fervently prayed that fire would start and ignite their altar and they would sacrifice and Baal would be proved to be the true God and no fire came. Well, then in about verse 37 of chapter 18 of 1 Kings, uh, Elijah steps forward. Okay, you've had your turn. You prayed fervently all day long. Now my turn to pray. And about a 25 second prayer, Elijah says to the one true God, would you strike down from heaven fire onto this sacrifice? And would you prove that you, O oh Lord, are God? And in that moment, God ignited that altar. And it erupted and started to consume that new calf that was a sacrifice to God. And I've been in this chapter praying over it and using it to encourage myself around the power of our God. The power of a 25 second prayer when you're full of faith and belief that God, the one true God, can intervene in your circumstances and can change them in an instant. My word of encouragement to you this morning is no matter what season of challenge you find yourself in, we can always be encouraged by the word of God that reminds us that God is the one true God, that there are not a whole lot of hoops that we need to jump through and do this and that. Elijah showed just kind of in a 30 second prayer, God, this is who you are. I believe in you. And you can do this. And I wonder for some of you this week, that might be the prayer you need to pray. God, here is my situation. Here is my circumstances. Would you come, the one true God, and would you, O oh Lord, prove that you are God? And would you come and intervene in my circumstances? Would you change and be the way maker that I need you to be right now? So church, I want to ask if you would bow your head right now and close your eyes as we go to God. So Heavenly Father, I don't know who this word was for this morning, but you do. And so I pray, God, because scripture tells us that the word of God never returns void, meaning that you will encourage and spur on and lift up the spirits of your people this morning. And so Father, I pray, would you minister by your Holy Spirit in the midst of some difficult trying situations. Some people have lost loved ones and it's remembered at this time of year that they're no longer sitting at the table. God, some are going through really complicated business uh, challenges right now in their workplace and they feel like there is no answer. And so this prayer goes to you for that, God. Oh Lord, would you prove that you are God? For people who are in between work and wondering how they're going to make it through this Christmas season. God, I pray that you would intervene and come into that situation. Students who are going through challenging times in, in their college studies and just wondering if you're there, they've been exposed to all kinds of other worldviews and wondering, God, are you real? Would you turn up and show yourself to be the one true God in the midst of that? Family dynamics and complications, God, I pray you'd minister in the midst of those. Lord, we pause to remember that Christmas is this annual reminder from heaven that this world is not what you intended it to be. And so you sent Jesus to break in, to usher in a new day of your plan and your purpose and your design once again being renewed in our time. So God, as followers of Jesus... We pause to remember the reason for this season is that you, oh God, sent Jesus, precious lamb, the unblemished sacrifice that we would know life, know it to the full, that your comfort and that your hope comes from the source of your hand. And we're grateful for it this morning, Jesus. We take this time as a faith community 
to gather in the awareness of your presence with us here, to align our lives to the thing that is most important, to center ourselves on your plan, on your purpose for our lives, Jesus. We love you. It's in your trusting name that we pray. And everyone agreed with that said? Amen Amen and amen. I want to ask our offering team if you would come down and uh, immediately start to collect our tithes and offerings. If you are visiting this morning, I want to take this moment to extend a special welcome to you. We're glad that you're here, that you've chosen to spend a Sunday in December with us, and we pray that uh, you are blessed by today's service. As the plates come down the aisle, if you're visiting, please don't feel obligated to participate. Just kind of pass it on to the next person. Uh, That's completely okay with us. And uh, as a visitor, I'm going to ask you to Uh, Just kind of excuse the next couple of moments because I'm going to talk to the regular attenders here uh, about our year-end offering, our Christmas offering, and kind of talk about some finances for a few moments. So if you are visiting, uh, as I said, just kind of please excuse the next couple of minutes uh, and then we'll uh, welcome you back into our service as we move forward. So uh, church, you know that uh, we've been a set up and tear down church for 17 years. We've been renting facilities, there's been uh, many great things about that, but there's also some pretty dramatic shortcomings in having to set up and and tear down every week. When I came in this morning, it was about 15 degrees uh, outside, and our campus care team were out putting signs in the ground and setting up, and I just had a moment of interacting with a couple of them. I said, thanks for serving, especially in this cold weather, and I thought to myself, one day, (laughs) one day there'll be a permanent sign and they won't need to be out there walking around like polar bears uh, trying to get something in this frozen ground so we can see our way around uh, this campus. But, you know, for a long time we've been praying that God would reveal a permanent home for us and we have this sales contract with this land on Winfield Road and we've had this kind of hashtag, no debt for dirt. And uh, this has kind of been our rally cry that we could buy this land uh, with cash and and not go into debt and then believe God as we move on to the next phase of what the building of it looks like. But we've been determined to have no debt for dirt in uh, this pursuit of our permanent home. And so I want to update you what that means as uh, we have a special offering uh, at the end of uh, this year to go towards this. So... Uh, The total cost of the land, including uh, closing costs and so forth, is $2,650,000. And right now, our savings uh, sits at $2,436,000. And so, yeah, it's fantastic. We are uh, so close to... Uh, fulfilling this desire that we've been praying and believing for. Uh, So the mathematicians between us, you've already done this in your head real quick, but for those of you who need a calculator, it's $214,000 is the deficit currently for us to reach this goal that we've been working towards, uh, which is really, really exciting. Uh, I want to offset that for a moment, give you an update where we are in our year-to-date finances. So... uh, Because of your generosity, our normal tithes and offerings, our general fund, uh, we're over target giving by $46,000 right now. And the diligence of the staff to continue in the operating budget to be under expenses, we're $65,000 under expenses. So as of right now, we're $111,000 in surplus that could be attributed to that $214,000 Uh, deficit to buy cash for our land, okay? Now, we have, including today, four Giving Sundays left in 2018. So, in order for us to uh, be able to use that 111,000, we have to continue in our faithful giving for our tithes and offerings to meet our weekly uh, giving target, and uh, that surplus could be added to it. If that were the case, our shortfall then is $103,000, So we want to take up a special offering, our year-end offering, to go towards that $103,000. And so I want to, again, as I do every year when we have this special Christmas offering, we have special initiatives that we want to give to over and above our normal tithes and offering, invite you to prayerfully consider 
if God might prompt you to be involved in closing that $103,000. Now, for some of you, you'll pray and you won't sense uh, God to, to prompt you to be involved, and that's completely okay. But for others of you, uh, God will prompt you and call you to give over and above, and uh, we want to try and close this 103000 and be fully cashed up, uh, ready to buy our land, with no debt for dirt. Hashtag no debt for dirt, right? We're, we're that close. Yeah. Okay, so how do you do this? Uh, there's a couple of ways to give. You go uh, to our website, willowwheaton.org forward slash give. It'll take you to push pay. When you go to the push pay, uh, just indicate on the box to go down to year end fund. And you can give online, you can do that your mobile device or uh, online on your computer. Uh, or you can write a check. And if you write a check, just simply put in the memo section, year-end fund. Or if you're running out of ink in your pen, you can just put Y-E-F uh, just in the memo section and prop it in the plate anytime in uh, the services in December. Uh, the online uh, fund is open right now. And so I'm believing and, and to, to tie in what I shared about from... 1 Kings 18, this has been a part of my prayer, has been to say, okay, God, when it comes to this goal that we would pay cash for our land, uh, would you, O oh Lord, prove that you are God? And uh, I'm just kind of inviting you into my chair time there. That's where I've been for the last couple of weeks. And so again, just if you feel prompted by God, you are an incredibly generous congregation, and I know that you hear from God. So I trust as you pray that you will uh, hear from him. All right, I want to tell you about our Christmas services uh, coming up in a few weeks' time. Uh, every year, uh, around the 23rd and 24th, we do Christmas services, just kind of something that we do. Uh, we like to do that. Christmas we do every year at the 25th. And so our services this year, uh, we're really excited about it. Scott has an incredible music run. Uh, Molly's doing a solo. Veronica's doing a solo. Uh, I have written a good portion of my message and I have this uh, first century insight on the first Christmas story, uh, something that I've never come across before. I'm really excited to share that with you. And then we'll end our service uh, with that tradition of singing Silent Night and you can all light your candles and this whole room will just be uh, illuminated by uh, candles and it's just a fantastic way for us to finish our Christmas services. So, our service times this year, on the 23rd Sunday, uh, we have 11.15 service. We have no 9 o'clock service on Sunday the 23rd. Now, I'm willing to wager $103,000 that someone will come <laughs> at 9 o'clock, okay? There is no 9 o'clock service, 11.15. And then on the 24th, we have two services, 1.30 and 3.30. Those three services are identical. You can come um, to any one of those Bring your friends, bring your family, uh, but I'm really believing that's going to be a significant Christmas service uh, this year and love to have you come and be a part of that. Well, right now I want to transition us to our teaching time. We're continuing in our Advent series called Awestruck. Our guest teacher today is Eugene Cho, and uh, Eugene's going to teach through the passage that actually Scott spoke of a moment ago as Mary's song. And uh, to prepare us for that and to honour God's word, I'm going to ask if you would please stand to your feet and I'm going to read Mary's song to us this morning. So Mary's song is found recorded in Luke 1, 46 through 55, and it reads, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who have proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. 
You may be seated as we join with our founding campus, South Barrington, with Eugene Cho. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to ask you to join me right now. We're going to be reading Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. The scripture is obviously behind me, but if you have your Bibles with you or if you have your apps, I'd love to encourage you to open your Bible, to look and to read for yourself as well. Now, I want to give you a little context. This here is... The Holy Spirit kind of speaking through Mary's soul. And Mary had just had a conversation with her cousin Elizabeth, who's about six months pregnant. And Elizabeth gives this word of affirmation of God's promises over Mary's life. And Mary bursts out into song. The Gospel of Luke is very interesting because it's the only gospel that records four songs around the Advent season, around the birth of Jesus. And this is the first of these songs. And theologians, pastors, Christians around the world, they often call this Mary's Magnificat, Mary's song. Earlier, we heard this beautiful, incredible medley about the Holy Spirit. And I was so convicted by our brothers and sisters who led us in song. I now want to ask you to use your imagination about how Mary might be singing the song. The song bursting out of her spirit. Now listen for God's word. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Well, church, let me give you a roadmap of how we'll spend the next half hour. I want to first speak to you about the why behind Awestruck. And then I want to speak with you about four things. I pray four practical, encouraging things that we can learn from Mary's story and about this song and about this particular passage that we just read. Now, let's speak about the why. Why Awestruck? Why is this our series? Why does this matter in our lives and in our world today? In short, the opposite, the antithesis of awestruck would be routine. It would be complacency. It would be simply settling in for less or little, or not what God imagined for us. Especially as we're thinking about this Advent and Christmas season, when we're supposed to be in absolute amazement of the power of God, the glory of God, the goodness of God, as God sends his only begotten son, Jesus, and Jesus enters into the world as a little vulnerable baby, if you and I are like perhaps others. If you're like me, sometimes we take it for granted. I'll give you another example. It's the holiday season. Thanksgiving weekend just passed. Christmas is right around the corner. And if we're not careful, it becomes very routine. And as a result, routine can sound like regurgitation. We long for comfort, but if we're not careful, comfort becomes complacency. Complacency feels like apathy. For example, over Thanksgiving, you gathered with your families. 
Some of it might have been good relationships. Some of it might have been strained. We overate like crazy. Some of us experienced a sense of comatose state because we ate so much. And then we watched some football. Go Seahawks. Some of us attempted to actually play flag football. You got hurt, got rushed to the hospital. Maybe we participated in the Black Friday shopping. What I'm saying is there's kind of a routine. And after a while, we lose the sense of awe over this Christmas season. Maybe it's reruns of some of your favorite movies that you love watching, the sound of music, or it's a wonderful life, or in my opinion, the greatest movie, greatest Christmas movie ever made, Elf. My favorite line, we elves try to stick to the four main food groups, candy, candy canes, candy corns, and syrup. But you get my point. It even leaks into our spiritual lives, into our church rhythms. It's possible that you walked into church today not with a sense of hope and expectancy, but a sense of routine. I'm here because I have to. I'm here because that's what Christians are supposed to do. I'm here because I'm checking my box. I'm here because my mom gave me the evil look. I don't know why you're here. It's possible that maybe in your mind you actually wrote the sermon in your head. I've been here. I've done this. I know exactly what this is about. And this series is exactly for you. We're praying that the Holy Spirit would stir and shake each and every single one of us, no matter where you are in the spiritual journey, that the Holy Spirit would speak to you, touch you, stir your hearts, especially during this Christmas season as we're in amazement that God came near to us. Now, let me give you one more example to drive the point about why this matters. On Monday, August 21, 2017, some of you, most of you will have no idea what I'm talking about, but as I share this, I bet some of you will know what I'm talking about. Monday, August 21, 2017 was a total mayhem in North America because we were experiencing a total solar eclipse. Some of you bought those eyeglasses or sunglasses. Some of you went outside, you took pictures with your kids. You took the opportunity to let them know how amazing the solar eclipse was. As a pastor, I loved it. I love that my church, my congregation, we're really getting into this. I love moments in our lives when we're reminded there is something bigger and greater than the mundane that's in front of us, that God is at work. And what I mean by this is that when we were studying the solar eclipse, it was an opportunity to remind people, to teach people that our galaxy and the universe is vast and phenomenal and great. Did you know, for example, that there are 100 and billion known galaxies in the universe? When I was a child in junior high school, I wanted to be an astronomer. So I asked my parents to buy me a telescope and I still remember using this telescope to look at the Milky Way galaxy. There are a 100 billion Milky Ways in the known universe. Each galaxy contains hundreds of billions of stars. Astronomers estimate as best as they can that in the known universe, the universe is home to a billion trillion stars. I don't know how many zeros that is, but it's a lot of zeros. And as people admire the stars, as people revel in our galaxies, what I try to tell them is, listen, there is a God who created those very stars. There is a God who created the galaxies. There is a God behind all that is good and beautiful. 
And yes, even to us, those who are self-professing Christians, would you take a moment, pause, and be in awe at the power of God. The power of God. It's stunning to me when I think about the biggest star known to us in humanity. It's a sun called the Canis Majoris, which is 2,100 times larger than our sun that warms up our earth. It means because of the size disparity that that particular sun, Canis Majoris, it would be able to house 9.2 9.2 billion of our sons in that particular star. This is our God. Take a moment, breathe. God, the God of the cosmos, sends his only begotten son. And this baby, consumed in flesh and bone just like us, enters into human story. Why? For God so loved the world. May you be awestruck. May you be amazed by the goodness of God. This is why I love how the psalmist in chapter eight, verse four says, who are we as mere mortals that you would be so mindful of us. That's why we're taking some time to consider this theme, awestruck. Now let's study Mary's life. Four things that I want you to consider, marinate on as we particularly study her song. Here's the first one, and it might not speak specifically to Mary, but it speaks to the cultural context during her time. Here's the first one. If you're taking notes or writing notes in your mind, it's this, the Holy Spirit is still on the move. The Holy Spirit is still on the move. Now, what do I mean by this? If we're all honest, there are going to be moments in our lives where we say, God, where are you? Where are you in my pain? Where are you in my loneliness? Where are you in my isolation? Where are you when this is not what I imagined for my life? Every single one of us. I know I don't know you hardly at all, but if there's a common denominator here, it's that there's pain and there's fear in every single one of us. And there may have been moments in your life where you have uttered that question, God, where are you? And I want you to know that's the context in which Jesus enters the story of humanity. During this time, there were numerous things that were going on, unjust things, painful things, hurtful things, destructive things going on around the Bible context and Bible days. I'll give you an example. There was a ruler by the name of Caesar Augustus who issues a decree for a census to be taken. It's part of that Christmas, Jesus' birth story. But what a lot of folks don't know is the why behind that census. It wasn't because they wanted just better, accurate information to care for the people. It was actually the opposite. They wanted a more accurate census in order to be able to tax people appropriately and more accurately. Why? Because they wanted more resources to build their military and to build the expansion of the Roman Empire and to continue their dominion and domination over nations. Some history buffs would call this the security of the Pax Romana. That was the state of this time that Jesus was born. We can't ignore this military power of the Roman Empire during this time. We're also familiar with the story of King Herod out of his fear and insecurity, how he initiates a massacre of all Jewish baby born boys during this time. How dark, how painful, and how difficult. 
In fact, between the Old and New Testament, there was approximately 400 years of what we perceive to be silence. There were no prophets. There were no prophetic words. There were no words of encouragement. There were no worship teams singing medleys and such. It was a time of darkness and discouragement. There was growing hostility and division between Jews and Gentiles. Samaritans were absolutely ostracized. There was so much disparity between the rich and the poor. That was the time in which Jesus enters into human story. That's the context in which Mary sings this song. So what's my point? It's really important. Here it is. Even when it feels or looks or appears that God is absent God is actually at work. The Holy Spirit is still on the move. And this is so important for us to know. Because you and I, if we're honest, we're driven by our feelings. And as a pastor, I hear so many congregants, including myself, will say, well, I don't feel God. I don't feel God's nearness. I don't feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not trying to diminish your pain or your feelings. I just simply want to remind you that God meets you where you're at. And this is the time that it's good to be reminded that behind the scenes, God is still at work. And what a beautiful story. Here's the second thing for us to be reminded of. God's ability to use you is not contingent on your ability. I'm not trying to knock or dismiss your jobs, your titles, your degrees. I'm not trying to say it's irrelevant. I'm simply saying that God's ability to use you, the Holy Spirit's ability to move you is not based upon your ability, but simply your availability. For you to say, yes, I'm here. I'm here, God. I want to be used by God. I want to be humble. I want to be open. Rather than a posture of having your arms closed for whatever reason, to have a posture of openness and humility. Oh, I think about Mary, and yes, Mary who... She was poor, she was young, she was inconsequential. She came from Nazareth, and you heard later what people said so brashly about Jesus. What good comes from Nazareth? Translation, you're useless. Your resume, your lineage is useless. But this is the story of God, the Holy Spirit. And you should be encouraged today because I can speak with absolute confidence that every single one of us here today is flawed, broken, and imperfect. And if you don't agree with me, you struggle with lying. (laughs) All of us are flawed, broken, and imperfect. In fact, if you were to read the Bible from cover to cover, with the exception of Jesus Christ, fully God, fully human, perfect, the Bible only has stories of flawed, imperfect women and men, and God still uses them. Now, I've heard pastors share these lists with different titles and different names, but here's my list of women and men that God chooses to use. Abraham and Sarah were, they lied, concealed, I'm sorry, Adam and Eve lied, concealed, and accused. God does not abandon them. Abraham and Sarah were old, which meant back then they were no longer useful to society. They had serious marriage issues. Noah was a drunk, Jacob was insecure, Joseph was abused, sold into slavery by his own brothers. Imagine that Thanksgiving dinner. Moses had a stuttering and confidence problem, Esther was an orphan, Elijah struggled with depression, Gideon was poor, which meant in that cultural context he was cursed by God. Rahab was a prostitute. David had a list too long for this sermon. Jonah was rebellious, unwilling to listen to God's instructions. John the Baptist was just weird. 
Martha was a type A workaholic. The Samaritan woman had numerous failed relationships. Thomas had doubts. Matthew was a tax collector who worked for the villainous Roman Empire. Paul was a Pharisee, a persecutor of Christians. Timothy was timid. Mary was poor. My point is this, Willow Creek, add your name to this list. Add your name to this list. If you're breathing and alive right now, the Holy Spirit is able to work and move through you. Oh, that encourages me. And I hope that it encourages you. Here's the third thing. Keyword, relationship. Now, what do I mean by relationship? I want you to know that Mary's song, yes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it's not something out of the blue. It's not out of a vacuum that the Holy Spirit stirs the song. It comes out of a relationship, a daily, a steadfast, a dependent relationship with God and the Holy Spirit. You see, when we read stories like this, if you're like me as Christians, we think to ourselves, well, why can't I have an experience like this? We're so enamored by the supernatural things, by the spectacular things, and I'm not saying that God isn't able to do that because clearly we just read it, but what we miss in the story, what's not recorded accurately is how Mary on a daily basis walks with God, seeks after God, knows God's word, studies God's word, hears God's voice in her life. It speaks to us so much about the importance of relationship. The best way for us to grow in our dependence on the Holy Spirit, to grow in our relationship with God, is to engage in a relationship with God every single day, in the daily, in the mundane, in the ordinary. Not just when you're seen, not just during Christmas season, but who we are, how we live our lives, when no one's watching us, when no one's paying attention to you, in our small groups, in our section groups, in our neighborhoods, in our dad groups, in our mom groups, in our workplaces, how we live our lives daily, open in our posture to the Holy Spirit, that matters to God. Relationship matters. If I'm losing you, let me give you this analogy. Right now, I'm uh, seeing a, uh, a trainer. So I'm trying to get a little healthier as I approach my 50th birthday in a couple of years. I'm 48 years old. Uh, props to Asian genes. And uh, so turning 40, 50 fairly soon, and I'm seeing this uh, trainer, and I'm trying to get to a point where I can do 100 push-ups at a time. And I'm very far away from that. Some of you were really impressed until I said, I'm very far away. And you're like, ah, oh, loser. So 100 push-ups. And I'm like talking to my physical trainer. And I'm like, uh, help me. And this is his best advice. He says, uh, Pastor Cho, the best way to become better at push-ups is to do push-ups. And at first, I was like, um, I'm paying you for obvious advice, but sometimes it's the obvious that's so profound. How do you hear and walk and build a relationship with God? You build it every single day. You take one step at a time. You learn how to pray. You learn how to hear God's word. You learn kindness and tenderness. You know what it means. And we ask the Holy Spirit every single day, Holy Spirit, speak to me. I wanna be open and available to you. In other words, build your relationship with God. Here's the fourth thing, and it's this. Mary was brave. Mary was brave. Now, let's talk a little bit about her context. Theologians debate about her age. We know that she was very young, especially from our cultural context. In our cultural context, 
man, she, this marriage or engagement would be illegal in our cultural context. Now, again, theologians, they aren't in absolute agreement because no one knows for sure what her precise exact age is. But let me give you some ballpark figures. They believe that Mary was approximately 12 to 14 years old when the engagement takes place. During that cultural context, engagements could last for many years. It could last a year, a couple years, but the distinction between engagement then and now is that when you were engaged, you were essentially married to that person. So the initial engagement, 12 to 14 years old, so the angel visits her, gives her this promise around that age, and then they also believe she was approximately 14 to 16 when she delivers birth to Jesus Christ. She was poor. And as I shared earlier, to be poor during the cultural context meant basically you were seen as cursed by God. Even religious people would use erroneous theology to explain why people were poor, blaming fault on them. She came from Nazareth, and the list goes on and on. Yes, Mary is brave, but here's an important point I want you to know. You've got to hear this. I cringe at the ways that sometimes people including other pastors talk about bravery or courage. When we're speaking about being brave or being courageous, it does not mean that it's the absence of fear in our lives. That's not what bravery is. If you and I, if we're honest, because we're human beings, every single one of us, we have pain, we also have fear. To be brave does not mean that you're fearless. To be brave means that you're human. And as a follower of Jesus, you acknowledge the fears that are present in your life. And by God's grace, even as we tremble, even by as we're somehow unsure, to be brave means that we believe and have faith that God in me through the Holy Spirit is greater than the presence of fears in my life. That's what brave means. It doesn't mean that we're going to somehow somehow remove all fears out of our lives. It creeps up in every single one of us, but that's what bravery means. Let's take Mary's life, for example. It's not recorded, but for me, as I study the scriptures, my imagination thinks, I wonder what it must have been like. Initially, she was afraid. And the angel comforts her, reminds her of God's promises, reminds her of God's presence. But can you imagine what that first, second, third conversation must have gone like with Joseph? Joseph, good news, I'm pregnant. I just can't imagine what Joseph must have said. What? How could you? How dare you? How could you betray me? What? An angel? The Holy Spirit? Are you crazy? We like to knock on Joseph, but how many of us would have responded in that same way? And the angel has to appear to Joseph to remind him, it's okay, what Mary said is indeed true. Can you imagine what her family must have said? How dare you bring shame to our family? How could you do this to us? Don't you know it's already so hard for our family? And how could you? You're insane. Can you imagine how people in her town must have responded to her? Nazareth was a very small town. Again, theologians, they think roughly 100 to 200 people. Translation, it's a town where everyone knows everyone and everyone wants to know everyone's business. The first couple months, maybe Mary, 
unsure, keeps things to herself, but eventually there's that baby bump, and the next thing you know, people are asking questions, then speculating, then the gossip. There were those who were so abrasive, they were speaking out loud, you're a horrible person, you're sinful, how could you do this to Joseph? And then there are those who are gossiping behind the scenes. And every single time I'm thinking of Mary being reminded of the fear of loneliness, rejection, isolation. And you know what I think Mary did? I think Mary remembered her song. That song that the Holy Spirit inspires out of her gut, out of her spirit when she sings, God, you are good. Your arm extends to the nations. You are merciful. You will call me blessed. I think she remembers that song. And I want you to know, she sings that song not just once in Luke chapter 1. She sings it days of her lives when she's reminded of fear, reminded of loneliness, reminded of rejection. She's singing that song over her life. So here's my question to you. What is your song? The song over your life when God intervened in your life, extended mercy and grace to you, when God gave you a word, when God gave you a promise, when God answered your prayers and you uttered words of gratitude, do you remember that song? Because we need to sing that song over our lives again and again and again. Many years ago, when I was in my mid-20s, I, uh, I had to go through my ordination process to become a, a minister of the word and sacrament through my denomination. And as I was going through this process, part of that uh, process was that I had to go see a psychiatrist and a therapist. And so I wasn't feeling all that excited about paying $800 over numerous hours to spend time with a psychiatrist, but I had to do this. And so I made an appointment and I saw someone named Dr. Brown, and she was good. I walked in, I was very just upset. I had, my body posture was probably very insular. And she looked at me and she goes, um, Eugene, you don't wanna be here, huh? And I said, yes, I do, I wanna be here. <laughs> she was good. But eventually she realizes that she needed to give me some time. So she goes to the closet, brings out this gallon of uh, chalk, crayons, and markers. And then she goes back to the closet, takes out this huge butcher roll of paper, rolls it on the ground. And then she says to me, Eugene, I wanna give you some time. And I wanna invite you, would you just draw your life? At first, I was like, I am not paying you 800 bucks an hour for a drawing lesson. But she eventually leaves. I'm imagining she's behind this like mysterious glass window where I can't see out, but she's looking through me, laughing at my insecurities. But I had to do this, so I take a crayon and I make a circle and I draw it in and I write down October 20th, 1970, which in Korean means Eugene Cho was born. Remember my birthday, October 20th, 1970. And then I started graphing my life, the ups, and downs. And it was kind of interesting because to be honest, I'm so busy in the here and now on the next thing that I rarely, if ever, take a moment to consider the big picture of my life. There was a down moment when there was a really painful experience in our family where we were separated. And to this day, when I think about it, it gives me tears. Maybe another day I'll share more. And then in 1977, things got a little more challenging when my parents decided not to tell me that we were moving from Korea to the United States. 
getting on an airplane for the very first time, getting off the airplane and realizing no one looks like me, and struggling through the challenges of immigration, struggling through xenophobia and bullying, in first grade, the scariest thing that I could think of was raising my hand as a seven-year-old boy who could not speak English, but the problem was I had to go to the bathroom a couple times. And so I would pee in my pants, and the first grade kids were ruthless. Middle school was challenging because I was voted the shyest kid in middle school and developed a stuttering problem, and high school had its challenges as well. But little by little, I, as I look back, I saw the ups and downs of life. When I was 18 years old, there was this momentous event in my life when I met this Hispanic custodian, a Mexican custodian by the name of Remando Gonzalez. He worked at the same building that my mother had her small little deli shop at an IBM building in Sunnyvale, California. And Remando would come up to me and we became good friends. I labored through four years of Spanish to be able to understand and speak Spanish. And Remando would come up to me and would say, Eugenio, my name in Spanish, Eugenio, tu necesitas a Cristo en tu corazón. You need Jesus Christ in your heart. And every single day, he would say, Eugenio, ¿quieres aceptar Jesús Cristo en tu corazón? Do you want to accept Jesus in your heart? And I would joyfully say, no. <laughs> in the summer of 1989, one of the highest moments of my life, I met Jesus. Next thing you know, I'm like looking at this butcher paper, and I'm just crying. As I look back, I see the arm of God. I see the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember your song? Sing your songs of joy and gratitude, of amazement, of being awestruck at the goodness of God. Sing your song. Friends, would you stand with me? We've all got that opportunity through the month of December to think through what God has done, not only in the, in the year of 2018, but further into our life, to know that Luke first records in chapter one this response of Mary for her song and for this challenge to be extended to us, for us to reflect, say, where are the ups and the downs? Where is the song of the rhythm of God's hand being present in our lives? You know, we live in a time where it's good for us every week to just remind ourselves that in the hustle and bustle of this holiday season, that we are called as followers of Jesus to take rest and take pause and to remember the opportunity that God's hand is present, outstretched to us, to acknowledge and to see. And so when we come and we acknowledge the Advent series, it's deliberate for us. It's a reminder for us to freshly align our lives and to remember the story of our song. Yes? Yes. I want to pray and we'll be done. But before I do that, I just want to make one more announcement uh, if you're a regular attender, you know that through the year of 2018, uh, we've been rebuilding our elder board. And uh, this morning, uh, one of the elder candidates, uh, Shoji, is here. And Andy Smith was part of the elder selection committee, and he's also uh, here. And so they'll be down the front after when I finish praying. And if you would like to uh, meet Shoji or ask any questions, then you're welcome to do so. With that, let's go to God in prayer. So, Father God, what a great thing it is for us to be reminded afresh today that we all have a song, a song of your fingerprints, of the rhythm, of the way that you have made yourself known in each of our lives. So, God, I pray as we walk into this week, we do so with a fresh awareness of the activity of God in and through us, in our families, in our workplaces, bringing the kingdom of God through us. So, God, would you... Quicken our attention to your Holy Spirit in this holiday season. 
reminding us that you sent Jesus. It's an annual reminder that the world is not as it ought to be, not as you intended it to be, and that we're on mission to bring the hope and love of Jesus. So God, may you hold your hand of blessing upon us and turn your face towards us, we pray. In the trusting name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Have a great week, everyone. Grace and peace.